My name is Sister Tanumi. I am from Fiji. Of course, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, we take tours of the temple. This temple is the fifth oldest of more than 120 temples we have all around the world. And it's very unique because it's located right in the middle of paradise in Hawaii. Have you ever wondered why there are no crosses on Mormon churches? Greetings, this is Dale Brown. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Mormon church, the pros and the cons. Though Latter-day Saints, as they are called, claim to be Christians, by doing so they deny the very foundation of the religion. In about 1830, their prophet, a young lad about 14 years old, named Joseph Smith, was praying in order that he might know which church to join. The Lord supposedly told him, quote, that he must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, and that their professors were all corrupt. Now, though this testimony is still printed in the Book of Mormon, it is downplayed, and a new, less offensive and sanitized message is presented today by the polite young missionaries. They still, however, point to him as being a prophet, and the one appointed by Jesus Christ to restore the, quote, true church. Now this is typical of all new religious cults, especially the ones that have popped up in America. They claim that they have a corner on the market. Now Smith's original claims were actually an attack on all of Christendom. Though modern day missionaries appear outwardly to be your friend, what they represent is still very much an enemy of the Church of Jesus Christ as it is recorded in the Bible. Christian ministers were actually mocked in the secret LDS temple ceremonies as being a hireling of Satan until the 1990 revision. In Mormon Doctrine by Mormon Elder Bruce R. McConkie in page 670, we read, If it had not been for Joseph Smith and the Restoration, there will be no salvation. There is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, if you really want to know how they look at other churches, there it is. Joseph Smith was advanced to Master Mason, degree of Freemasonry, in March 15, 1842. And that is what you find in the Mormon temple ritual, many of the same tokens, signs, and horrible penalties, such as slit throats and hearts and vitals torn out and all that, for revealing temple secrets, as in Freemasonry. Now some of these symbols are also found on their temple aprons and garments, or magic underwear, some people call them, that resemble old-fashioned long johns. The Freemasonry deity, who is Abaddon, or Lucifer, is represented by an obelisk or a pole. Our first president, George Washington, was a mason, thus his monument stands in Washington, D.C. as a 555-foot obelisk. On many of these early LDS buildings and temples, one can see occult symbols such as the all-seeing eye, the Masonic handshake, pentagrams, and etc. It is interesting to note that Mormons are quite concerned about the ordinance of water baptism, yet when it comes to the ordinance of the communion table, there's a little twist. Instead of taking bread and wine, or fruit of the vine, as most churches do, and as was the Passover custom and the command of Jesus, they take bread and water. Now the wine is a symbol of Jesus' blood that was shed on Calvary. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There's no remission of sin, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Now all false religions avoid or water down the teaching about blood atonement. Satan and all his demons fear the blood of Christ. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says, They, that is the believers, overcame him, the devil, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, now the Bible tells us that the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now that was Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Like many cults, the Mormons use Christian terminology. In fact, for the sake of public relations, they've modified both their history and their logo in order to downplay words like Mormon and Latter-day Saints and to magnify the name Jesus Christ. The Mormon concept of God, however, is still the same as it's always been. It's similar to Hinduism. They are actually polytheistic. They believe in many gods. 
If that were not bad enough, they also believe they're going to become gods. One popular quote from Mormon prophet Lorenzo Snow is, quote, As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. One Mormon book of scripture called Pearl of Great Price contradicts the Bible by claiming there are many gods who formed the earth, and that's in Abraham chapter 4. While the Bible clearly states that there is only one God, quote, Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. That's out of Isaiah chapter 43.10 and 44.6. Satan also claimed that man could become like gods through eating the forbidden fruit, and that brought a curse on man and got him driven out of the Garden of Eden. That's in Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 through 24. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies, according to Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 44. The source of the lie that we can become gods is the same today. The destination of those who endorse it will be the same, eternal judgment. Jesus said, we would know them by their fruit. No matter how nice the people may be, the fruit of Mormonism is based on false prophecies and lies about Jesus Christ and the Bible. Though there has been a need for spiritual revival at different times throughout history, the idea that the true church ceased to exist until Joseph Smith or any other cult leader came along is a faulty one. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. As Apostle Paul wrote, Jesus is the rock. The church isn't the rock, or some prophet, or some new revelation. If Joseph Smith were really a prophet of God, there wouldn't be all the contradictions that you see in the Book of Mormon, and Pearl Great Price, and other Mormon writings. Just for example, why does the Book of Mormon say that the Son of God, Jesus, was born in Jerusalem? That's in Alma chapter 7, verse 10, instead of Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Hebrew means literally the house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life. He could have been born no other place and fulfilled the prophecy of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Now see, the Book of Mormon supposedly records a time period between 600 B.C. and 421 A.D., uh, the problem with that is it records horses and cows and oxen and asses and all kinds of things in the Americas that didn't show up until they were brought here by the Europeans. Silk is listed as being found in America when actually the silkworm uh, moths it produced it hadn't been introduced from Asia quite yet. Now that's in First Nephi chapter 13 verse 7. The Book of Mormon lists coins in Alma chapter 11 verses 4 through 20. The problem is, none of them have ever been found. You can't go to a museum any place and see a coin that's listed in the Book of Mormon. Yet, coins mentioned in the Bible are displayed in collections throughout the world. Why does the Book of Mormon say that darkness would cover the earth for three days at Christ's death on the cross? That's in uh, Helaman uh, 14.20 and 27 and 3 Nephi 8 verse 3. And actually the Bible says it was three hours in Luke. 2344. Why does the LDS writing say that Enoch lived for 430 years in Moses 8 verse 1 and B&C 107 verse 49, whereas the Bible says 365 years in Genesis 623? Well, I think the answer is pretty clear. Joseph Smith is a false prophet. He obviously didn't know his Bible very well. According to Mormonism, in Doctrine and Covenants section 130 verse 22, God the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. Jesus said God is spirit in John chapter 4, verse 24. Then defining a spirit, he said later on in Luke 24, 39, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Why does the Mormon church no longer teach polygamy? Joseph Smith said that having many wives was a, quote, new and everlasting covenant, and if you abide not that covenant, then you're damned, for no one can reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into glory. That's in D&C 132, verses 4 through 6. The Bible, however, says that church elders or overseers must be, quote, the husband of one wife. That's 1 Timothy 3, verse 2.